And we're back. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the Power Is Now Real Estate Roundtable. What I love about the Real Estate Roundtable is that it's a it's a discussion for real estate professionals about the real estate business. And folks, we cover it all here from REO to commercial to residential uh, real estate and the strategies to buy or sell real estate, to invest in real estate. All of that is happening right here on the Power Is Now Real Estate Roundtable. With me today is the fabulous Brandy Nelson, who is the executive director of REOBroker.com. You should check out that organization uh, for more opportunities if you're in the default space. And she's also a real estate broker out in the Palm Desert area. And also Steve Ripken, all the way from Connecticut, is in the house. Now, uh, Steve mentioned that is the place of the greatest pizza. I think Chicago might argue with him. But in spite of that, he's with us today, and uh, we thank you both for being a part of the show. And Darren, I really appreciate your time today to talk about these very, very important uh, topics. And so uh, we're now talking about foreclosures. And uh, uh, can you give us kind of an overview of, of what your thoughts on uh, are about the foreclosures that are happening across the country? Yes, I mean, coming out of the pandemic or in, in the middle of the pandemic, uh, we, uh, to be honest, we believe there was a good chance that there could be a pretty big wave of foreclosures hitting as a result of the economic shock that was experienced during the pandemic. I think it's fair to say now, uh, a couple of years later, that that is definitely not materialized. And and I do have, um, and I don't think it is at least because at least directly because of the pandemic going to materialize. Uh, but I do have some some slides that illustrate how that this has played out and then where we think this is going uh, in the future. All right. So here is this is actually auction.com data. And we account for about 50 percent of all foreclosure auctions nationwide, 40 to 50 percent. So I think it's pretty indicative of what's going on across the country and we're nationwide. So when you look at the left hand side here, this is the the number of properties that are actually going to foreclosure auction and being auctioned off, either selling to a third party or going back to the bank as an REO. Um, and everything there is relative to our 2019 level. So I use 2019 as a benchmark of, of normal, uh, normal levels of foreclosure auction volume. And if you look at these properties brought to auction, those are running, and in fact, in this goes through December of 2023, December, it dropped to 33% of those 2019 levels. It was running around 40 to 50% for most of the year. Um, but it, it, needless to say, we are at basically 40 to 50% of, or 60 to 50 to 60% below 2019 levels when it comes to these foreclosures brought to auction. The yellow line there is scheduled auctions. Those are auctions that are scheduled but may not actually take place. Those are running a little bit higher, but we're seeing a higher cancellation rate. More of the auctions are being canceled. So that's what's happening there. And then a similar story on the REO side. These are, again, auction.com specific, but I think this applies to the market as a whole. Um, but our, our volumes are running at about 30 to 40 percent of pre-pandemic or 2019 levels when it comes to REO auctions. So there's no doubt that not only did a, a huge wave of distress not materialize, it we didn't see any increase at all. I mean, we saw we were, we definitely saw an increase off of the the record lows during the pandemic, as you can see there. But we're still running, and this seems to be the new normal: is this very muted lower level of foreclosures. Um, and to put it in context, 2019 was was a very low level of foreclosures compared to say 2008 2009 and so that's what that's what we're seeing right now i, I will show real quick here uh, another slide that that shows it does vary a little bit by state the green states here this is as of the fourth quarter of 23 are where we're seeing foreclosure volume emerge more quickly and in fact in some states it is but where it's over a hundred percent means it's it's above 2019 levels. So you do tend to see that more in the Rust Belt um, and Midwest, but in the Northeast and Southeast, you're seeing the, the darker blue indicates that foreclosure volumes are still very muted relative to 
uh, their 2019 levels. Well, I, I think it's significant to know you're using 2019 as a benchmark. And what is significant about 2019 versus maybe 2013 as when I saw the kind of the fall off of REO? Yeah, I think we just wanted to benchmark it to, okay, here's what we were seeing as kind of this normal market. And 2018 was a very, I would say, healthy, for the most part, uh, housing market, as, as close to normal housing market that you could you could be in. And so we just wanted to benchmark back to there. We could benchmark back. It is somewhat arbitrary. We could benchmark back to different uh, different points in in the history. But we, we chose 2019. So, Darren, what are the reasons why we didn't see the the avalanche of foreclosures? What what took place? I mean, uh, I know our unemployment is low, uh, but you know how unemployment numbers are calculated versus what you know what we actually see and feel and know about uh, are two different things. In fact, <laughs> uh, we also know that. Income levels, uh, what people are earning, or you know, it's not keeping up with inflation, and so, uh, and then there are other signs like student loan debt, consumer debt, and other things. So, what's why? Why aren't we seeing more foreclosures? Why are people? How are people holding on? So, I think yeah, there's a variety of reasons. Number one, I don't want to to make this sound like I'm uh, being dismissive, but the the pandemic, in terms of economic shock. The pandemic was relatively short lived, uh, and there, if you look at the unemployment rate, it spiked very high, but it was for a very short period of time that it was so high. So that's number one. One of the reasons it was relatively short lived is there was massive amounts of government stimulus thrown mm -hmm. at uh, and thrown at it in an effort to uh, mute the the economic shock. And, and so I think that's a huge reason that includes at the housing market. Uh, there's many examples of that. One of the, the main ones I look at is a homeowner assistance fund, $10 billion given to, to, to as grants to homeowners who are in distress. So that's, you know, that stimulus piece is part of it. And then on top of that, you have uh, also unprecedented uh, foreclosure prevention policies put in place including forbearance and a foreclosure moratorium for, uh, I think it was a period of, of about 18 months, maybe not quite that long, uh, that that really kept the, the, the avalanche from starting, getting rolling in the first place. And those, many of those foreclosure prevention policies have continued at least in some form, even past the pandemic. And so that we, we have a new world that we live in, in terms of the loss mitigation and the forbearance that's being thrown at these distressed homeowners to try to help them stay in the home um, is is another big reason for for, uh, for why we're seeing the, these muted levels of, um, of foreclosure activity. So I know many of the homeowners were giving forbearance and some of them were given extensions. They were putting the balance of the loan on the back end, making them 40 year loans. But some of them now are getting to the point where that money is due. Are you seeing that there is going to be a problem when those forbearance and all those uh, prevention has um, been dried up? Yes. I we One thing that we're noticing, if we especially look at FHA, loan data where this is available. Um, there has been this rise over the last few months in loss mitigation failures. And so what that means or yeah, what that means is folks have, have gotten some form of loss mitigation like a, a longer term or some kind of loan modification. And they're coming out of that and they're they're still going delinquent. So they're, they're failing that. And that has been on the increase uh, and so I think there are some signs that for a lot of people, those that lo those last mitigation efforts helped and is going to help them stay in the home permanently. But there is a segment that it just um, unfortunately prolonged the inevitable. And and we're seeing some signs of that in, in the uh, in the increasing loss mitigation failures. And we're hearing that anecdotally from our clients as well. Um, but. You know that said, I have the, the the government continues to throw 
new ideas out there to try to keep these homeowners in their homes. And so the most recent one being the payment supplement from also from the FHA that actually supplements, uses the partial claim mechanism that FHA has to supplement the, um, the payment that the borrower is making up to 25% of that payment. And so, and that can last for up to three years. So I don't, even though we are seeing this increase, I don't, in loss mitigation failures, um, I, there's nothing pointing to, you know, a massive, and not that you're asking this Brandy, but uh, nothing pointing to a massive, massive increase in uh, foreclosure volumes, at least in the near future. That makes sense. And the other question is, we keep hearing about the shadow, the zombie foreclosures. Can you can you touch on that? Explain how that even came up. Where is this supposed zombie foreclosures? Can you explain that? Yeah, that's an interesting because it's a phrase I remember a lot being bandied about uh, during the the last crisis, Correct. and that was more these foreclosure these properties that because of the foreclosure prevention efforts and delays for different reasons, there were properties that ended up just sitting vacant for a long period of time. The people had given up on the loans and left, but the, the banks were not foreclosing for, for one reason or another. I, I think in this context, I, there, I think there are some of these properties that are sitting around. Maybe the most... Um, there, there's not a huge number of them, but the, the biggest segment of them would potentially be in, or at least proportionally, in the reverse mortgage space um, properties because the there's been really a hesitancy to foreclose on these reverse mortgages um, just because of the, the, the situation and you know dealing with elderly homeowners who are already vulnerable. So that's that's maybe a pocket I see of these zombie foreclosures, but I'm not seeing um, seeing a lot of evidence of that. One thing I did want to talk about that I think it relates, and maybe we can talk about it in a second, is what we're seeing happening is a lot of these homeowners, given more and more time to avoid foreclosure, are finally deciding, okay, I'll just sell the house. Right. And these what we call the pre foreclosure sales. If we take pre foreclosure sales as and then foreclosure auction sales, and then REO sales all together as a total distress market, if we consider those distressed sales, pre-foreclosure sales now account for about 60% of all distressed sales. Whereas before the pandemic, it was um, more like thir about a third, 35% of all distressed sales. And so that's a big shift, I think, is that given this more and more time, these homeowners, and I think this is honestly the hope of of some of the government policies is that if you just give these homeowners more time, they'll finally make the decision, I'm going to sell this property without being forced to sell the property. And I, and we can also talk about this in a, if we want to, but those pre-foreclosure sales are where I see potentially opportunity for um, agents who have operated in the REO world for, for a long time. Thank you for saying that, because I think that is a huge segment that I've also been telling my members about is the pre foreclosures and that there is a huge opportunity. That's what I'm seeing there. Awesome. We're going to talk about that opportunity, maybe even with auction.com. And um, but before we transition there, uh, Steve, do you have any questions uh, for Darren? Uh, thank you for speaking about the zombie uh, foreclosures. Um, I don't know if the empty houses will um, all be occupied by the the uh, the sellers who realize they have to sell their house, but when they go to move somewhere, they have nowhere to go but the zombie homes. So we'll uh, we'll have to watch that. But um, I, I guess uh, in watching the commercial the commercial side of things, um, they're not quite at break point, but it seems like there's a storm brewing, and um, we're seeing um, you know changes in uh, availability and cost to capital uh, on commercial. How do you feel that's going to affect the residential retail, residential REO and retail sales? Yeah, I, I, I see that commercial as one of the, one of a list, you know, a fairly short list of 
kind of what I would call external factors to the residential real estate market that could, if it, if it became big enough of a problem, could ripple out and affect negatively the residential real estate market. And we're definitely seeing signs of that. I, I would say it's it's a little bit lower on the list as a likelihood of rippling out to the residential real estate market right now. But it certainly could emerge as we see more of those if if we if and when we see more of those defaults happening on the commercial side. Um, another risk factor I see that was talked about, I think at NADP quite a bit and some of the other conferences I've been at is rising home insurance and property taxes um, could be one of those triggers that creates, uh, you know, a, a, an increase in in delinquencies and defaults on the residential side. That's another one I'm looking at. I think recession is another one that's a little bit more obvious um, of a risk factor that could trigger that. So, you know, and there could be another, <laughs> you know, I, I almost hate to say it out loud, but there could be another pandemic or something like that that we're not even thinking about that could um, trigger that. And, and so that I would, I would put commercials, uh, commercial uh, market defaults on that list of possible risk factors in the next 12 to 18 months, um, kind of in the middle of a list of 10, <laughs> maybe 10 factors. Insurance is actually a huge uh, crisis in a lot of areas right now, especially California and Florida. In fact, we just had somebody in the Bay Area. I'm in Palm Springs, so not my area, but one of my members. $18,000 for one year on their insurance, and they no longer can now afford the payment. They're going to let the house go. These type of things are happening and increasing where they cannot no longer afford their payment. And if they're doing PITI, and now all of a sudden their payment gets raised another $600 a month, and now they no longer can afford that mortgage payment. Yeah, great point. These are some incredible risk factors that you have identified. And um, Darren, for the sake of uh, those who are watching and are listening, if you could just restate again and kind of the order of uh, the factors that could lead to, uh, you know, greater uh, foreclosure activities, particularly in areas that have been more vulnerable uh, because of the you know, the economy or the density or whatever the factors are more vulnerable to foreclosure uh, than in other areas. Uh, yeah, I'd probably put, based on everything I've been looking at recently, I'd probably put that rising home insurance and property taxes at the top of the list as a potential risk factor of kind of a new, this is not really talking about the def defaults that have, the deferred defaults from the pandemic, but more of like potentially a new, uh, a new increase wave. in it defaults mm -hmm. new wave I, I hate you know I don't want to don't want to use the word wave, wave too much but a new uh emerging risk and so okay. I, I put that at the top of the list I would say you know it's tough to categorize them but you know recession I, I do think it's very likely we'll see at least a mild recession this year and I know a lot of folks have been saying that for a long time so it's hard to believe them but um some of the factors I look at indicate at least a mild recession this year, and that would result in an increase in defaults. Um, I think the, uh, the commercial defaults is on that list, maybe around three, three to five. Uh, I think, um, you know, some kind of, uh, fall, well, falling home prices, uh, is absent of, of necessarily any of these other risks, maybe just because of the affordability or rising inventory, we would see prices fall. And, and that could also trigger uh, some, some defaults on folks who all of a sudden thought they had a lot of equity in their homes and, and uh, maybe don't have as much equity. So that, that'd be my maybe short list of, of the top five. I think I made name five there. <laughs> For those of you just joining us, we're talking to Darren Bloomquist. Uh, he's a vice president of market economics at auction.com. And uh, folks, we're in the final stage here of this interview, and uh, it's been great so far. I've learned a lot, Darren. Uh, this has uh, really been informative. Uh, when we come back, we're going to get his final thoughts on you know, what investors should do, what agents should think about knowing given this information, what strategies should they employ, the opportunity at auction.com. All of that right here, right now on the Powers Now Real Estate Roundtable. We'll be right back.
The Power Is Now magazines are the leading resource for real estate agents, mortgage bankers, entrepreneurs, and small home ownership businesses, providing leaders with business strategy information, resources, and tools through PIN, Real Estate, Programming Guide magazines. Stay up to the minute with real estate news and information from industry experts. Subscription is free. Sign up today. Thepowersnow.com. Thepowersnow.com. Thank you.